happy summer, everybody. Welcome to Emmanuel. We're here to encounter God. He has called us here. Now remember that. Psalm 136 tells us to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's respond to him as we now stand and sing together. Beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God and Son of Man, truly I'd love Thee, truly I'd serve Thee, Light of my soul, my joy, my crown. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man. Glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. First Peter tells us, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's continue to worship. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my the one who set us free. shown us, which are currently in our lives, as well as thoughts, words, and deeds that we have selfishly completed without including your advice or attention. We ask you to forgive us and help us to turn from our sins and set us free. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We come to you in Jesus' name. We put our trust in you to help us make the corrections needed. Now, listen to our hearts as we now silently, privately pray to you. Jesus' name, amen. 
Ladies and gentlemen, there is good news. The gospel, the most important thing that we all know in our hearts, that because of what Jesus Christ did on that day, all of your sins are forgiven. Amen. of those around you. Speak it over our church, over our community. His name is powerful. The name of Jesus. Your name, Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the most of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. You have no rival. You have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, in your relationships with one another, 
had the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Amen. Let's sing the chorus again. What a powerful name. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Lord God, you've given Jesus the name above all names. We claim that name, Lord. We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves little followers of Christ. We just want to follow you, Lord. We want to hear your word today. Please open our hearts and our minds to what you would tell us. Let's check ourselves at the door and just have your Holy Spirit come and let your Holy Spirit take over and teach us what you would have us to learn. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, a blessed good morning, Emmanuel. A blessed good morning, Emmanuel. If there is a praise in you, let it out. Come on, if there's a praise in you, let it out. Praise the Lord. Well, my name is John Wheeler. It's an honor to be standing in front of you today. Today is July 9th. There's a, there's a national holiday associated with it, but it didn't make any sense, so I'm not kidding. Usually I do this, but... Um, today is the second Sunday in July, so we know that it's not only the Lord's Day, but it's also the 51st graduation ceremony for Faith International University. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hence the tie. I know we don't normally dress up with, with suits and ties here at, the, at Emmanuel, but today's a special day for many reasons. But I want to acknowledge what's been happening here the last several months. The decision by so many people, not only attending, but also newly attending to observe a baptism, and then they publicly profess this newfound freedom that's found only in Jesus, in and through not only their water baptism, but some people have received Jesus for the very first time here at Emmanuel. Amen? Amen. Come on. The Lord really is here in our midst. And as I said, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be walking with so many of you through this journey of a lifestyle that is unto the Lord. As we prepare for today's message, can we give a shout out to Pastor Dan, who's serving our country in El Centro, California. It's a, it's a nice, tempered uh, 120 degrees. <laughs> That's what he gets for serving in Pearl Harbor, huh? <laughs> we love you, Pastor. Amen? Amen. Come on. Yeah. 
He is a tough act to follow, I will tell you. I do want to take this time, though, to unpack some details as we look at the text, but as, also as we look around this room, and there's so many new faces. Every, to- every week I come in here, I'm like, oh my goodness, brand new folks, look at this, <laughs> right? So our job is to catch them, jo- God's job is to clean them, right? So let's not get, the, let's not get this thing, these, these di- different distinctives mixed up. As we look at the posture of discipleship, which is the title of the message for today, the posture of discipleship, we're going to learn about an invaluable lesson of firstborns as we look at the transformation that takes place in Martha. She reminds me of a story. A, a couple had just welcomed their firstborn child into the world. The father, overjoyed, decided to go out and buy a massive teddy bear for his daughter as a gift. When he got to the toy store, he explained to the storekeeper, this is for my firstborn child, so it needs to be extra special. The shopkeeper nodded and presented him with the the largest teddy bear that he had in the store. The father was ecstatic and immediately bought it. As he was leaving the store, a woman stopped and said, wow, that's a massive teddy bear. Your child must be very special. The father, father, beaming with pride, replied, oh, yes, she is. And this is her first teddy bear. I want to make sure it's the biggest and the best. The woman looked slightly confused. He said, but isn't she too young to appreciate such a large teddy bear? He said, well, perhaps it's more for me to remember the day. You see, as I've heard, firstborns are, everything's extremely heightened. The joy, the excitement, the pain, the suffering. (laughs) For those of you with teenagers out there, uh, sometimes that teddy bear is the only thing that we have left to cling to, amen? But I promise you, with a house full of firstborns, we have a blended family, myself and my wife, Kim, where we have two firstborns. So on the, tra- on the tail end of the first firstborn, I can tell you, they do come back. Amen? So this posture of discipleship or learning, right, there's a lot of quotes that come to mind. For parents to see a child grow up without learning about Christ is a far greater dereliction of duty than for parents to have children who have grown up without learning to read or write, says Donald Barnhouse. Thomas Craner says, the learning of the Christian ought to begin with fear of God. Without a doubt, what helps us most in accepting and dealing with suffering in an adequate view of God, learning who he is and knowing he is in control said Joni Tata. When we learn to hold the world with a loose grip, we are learning to take hold of the world to come with a firm grip, Sinclair Ferguson. And from Spurgeon, I don't think a man ought to hear a minister preach three sermons without learning the doctrine of atonement. We'll get back to that later. But ladies and gentlemen, today I want to share with you a message centered around the extraordinary woman of faith, Mary. In the Gospel, Luke, chapter 10, verse 38 to 40, we encounter a profound encounter between Jesus and two sisters, Mary and Martha. Let us delve into this passage as we explore the valuable lessons that it offers us as we will see, and we'll see how far the Lord takes us today. Luke 10, 38 begins as, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way home, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that she had made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. As we look throughout the Bible, something extraordinary occurs when a person's name is mentioned twice. In fact, it changes their life forever. In Genesis 22, we hear God say, Abraham, Abraham, and he makes Abraham prove his faith. In Genesis 46, he says, Jacob, Jacob, and he makes Jacob Go to Egypt. Exodus Exodus 3, we hear God say, Moses, Moses, and he makes Moses go to Pharaoh. In 1 Samuel, he says, Samuel, Samuel. He makes Samuel his mouthpiece. Luke 22, he says, Simon, Simon, and he actually makes Simon a denier. 
which he later forgives. Matthew 27, Jesus himself cries out, my God, my God, as he makes a plea to his father. Acts 9, Saul, Saul, God makes the least likely convert into Paul. And in Luke 10, we hear him say, Martha, Martha. Jesus made Martha understand the posture of discipleship. So here, Jesus visits the home of Martha and Mary. As this is Martha's home, she's diligently attending to household chores. This is not inherently wrong. She's serving an essential part of Christian life. She's providing for the needs of her guest, who's no less than Jesus himself. However, in her preoccupation, she misses the crucial point. While being carried away with the duty of serving, she neglects the person whom she's serving. Mary did not speak. She sat directly at his feet. Mary chose a different path. Rather than busying herself with serving, she sits at the feet of Jesus, eagerly awaiting his teachings. This sitting at at someone's feet, this is an idiom that we learn about by studying Eastern culture. The senior research professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary, Daryl Box, says that there's an idiom in Eastern culture that says, let your house be a meeting place for sages and sit in the dust of their feet and drink in their words with thirst. Mary actually chose to break all cultural norms, to sit at Jesus' feet as, you know, as a woman in a patriarchal society, she considers herself worthy to be a disciple. Well, Martha is running around. Imagine, the, the Messiah walks into your house. You want it to be spotless. Don't get me wrong. You want everything to be in place. But at the very same time, this is the Messiah. Are you going to be worried about cleaning your house, or are you going to be worried about sitting at his feet? H.B. Charles says, <laughs> Mary is at Jesus' feet, while Martha's all up in his face. <laughs> if you know the distinguished H.B. Charles, that'll get you on the way home. One precedes the other. Before you can outwardly serve, you must first inwardly worship Jesus. Let that sink in. So often we reverse this order. We want to serve before we worship. Martha, feeling overwhelmed, approaches Jesus and requests that he instruct Mary to assist her. However, Jesus responds with these memorable words. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary's chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. The first lesson about the posture of discipleship in this passage is that the importance of prioritizing our relationship with Jesus. Like Mary, we should have a hunger for his word, eagerly seeking to spend time in his presence and listen to his teachings. Our lives can be consumed with various tasks and responsibilities, causing us to lose sight of the most essential aspect of spiritual connection with Christ. We should probably take a moment and just even evaluate our own lives as we consider if we've allowed the distractions of this world to overshadow our time with him. I know I have. I know my children have. As I disciple my household with my wife, as we co-labor together, are we making sure that our children aren't scrolling? Are we instructing our children to fear the Lord? Another key lesson we can learn from Mary's example is the significance of being fully present with Jesus. She sat at his feet, indicating a posture of humility and attentiveness. This is the position of a learner or a disciple, 
sitting at the feet of the rabbi. In our fast-paced lives, it's so easy to be physically present in church or in our devotional times, but mentally absent, preoccupied with worries, to-do lists, or the constant demands of our digital devices. I know there's a lot of phones just went away. <laughs> Let us be like Mary, deliberately setting aside distractions and allowing ourselves to engage with Christ fully. May we be present in mind, heart, and spirit, ready to receive his wisdom and guidance. Furthermore, we can observe Mary's boldness and willingness to break societal norms. In that culture, as I said, women were typically expected to serve while men engaged in religious discussions. Yet Mary chose to disregard those expectations and, to, and take a traditional place reserved for male disciples. And Jesus said, well done. Hmm. What does that say to us as the church? Jesus welcomed. We've heard about Mary. He welcomed this woman to sit at his feet. This is the same Mary of Bethany that poured the ointment on his feet and wiped it with her tears in her hair. Still, it's essential to recognize Jesus' affirmation of Mary's choice. He declares that she's chosen what is better, a deeper spiritual connection with him. Jesus values our devotion, our eagerness to learn, and our desire to be with him. He invites us to prioritize him above all else, promising that his, this choice will never be taken from us. Let us respond to this invitation by placing Christ at the center of our lives, knowing that in him we find true fulfillment, purpose, and eternal significance. Remembering Jesus' words, Martha, Martha, you're worried about many things. You're upset. We'd be well served to study what the Bible says about anxious thoughts. If we find ourselves becoming anxious or troubled like Martha, it's a sign that we need to slow down and spend more time at the feet of Jesus. These anxious thoughts are addressed throughout the Bible worrying about the dishes, comparing, comparing ourselves with others, not being bold and courageous, fear of man, fear of what have you. In Philippians, Paul's final ex exhortation, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, I'll say that again, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to the Lord, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This posture of discipleship, with prayer and petition, Here's a serious question. We have a lot of new people here. A lot of new faces. So how can we know that God hears us when we pray? Don't we need a pastor or a priest to make our requests known to God? Thank you. <laughs> Come on, Russ. <laughs> right? <laughs> no. That's right. That's why I'm reminded again, it said... Spurgeon, as I was going through this, the preparation for the sermon, said, I do not think a man ought to hear a minister preach three sermons without learning the doctrine of atonement. This isn't jaywalking here, as Dr. Michael Adams will say. I'm going to jaywalk through the text a little bit here, but it's okay because we're right on path. We're going to stay on path. Romans 6.23 says this, the wages of sin are death. That means that there's a sacrifice required. Pastor walks into a police station 
to pay a parking fine and notices that there's a woman that appears very frightened reading her Bible. He asks, is there anything I can do to help? She says, no, Eve just ate the fruit and I got so scared that I came down here to finish the story under police protection. Because that was the law from the very beginning. The wages of sin are death. And death required atonement or forgiveness or a propitiation, to use a larger word, for our sin. Adam and Eve, God comes in, brings the animal. Cain and Abel, they offered the sacrifice, which one was pleasing and acceptable. Abraham and Isaac, Abraham brought Isaac up the hill. Aaron the Levitical priesthood. This is the biblical order by which we have been given authority to pray because of what our high priest has done for us. The ceremonial and legalistic nature of how sins were atoned for on an altar involving a rope tied to a priest's ankle to make sure that he didn't get taken away due to an unpleasing sacrifice along with the manner in which the lots were cast to determine which goat would be given as as a burnt offering and which one would be allowed to escape? That's where we get our word scapegoat. This was finished as Jesus served as the final high priest who became the perfect sacrifice, atonement forever. And Jesus cried out, Matthew 27, 50, he says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from the top to the bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tearing of the veil between the holiest of holies allowed our prayers to be heard and fill golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, according to Revelation 5.8. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 actually tells us to pray without ceasing and Oswald Chambers says this. He said, we should think about prayer as the breath in our lungs and the blood from our heart. Our blood flows ceaselessly and breathing continuously ceaselessly. We are not conscious of it, but it's always going on. We're not always aware that Jesus is keeping us in perfect union with God, but as we obey him, he is. Prayer is not an exercise It's a lifestyle. Give thanks in all circumstance. Yeah, that's that's pretty difficult to do, though. You lose a job, you lose a spouse, you lose a, a child. Life happens. But prayer is what changes our perspective. Either God answers your prayer, or he changes your heart to be able to acclimate and adjust to what's in front of you. That's why in James it says, we are able to count it all joy when we face trials and tribulations of different kinds through prayer. We put on a garment of praise. The only way that we can do that is if our heart is realigned with the Lord, knowing that he's in full control. Prayer gets... The disciples knew all about prayer. They'd heard prayer on the street corners. They'd heard all about the the rabbis and the religious of the day standing on the street corners. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners just to be seen by others. Truly, I say, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When we look at the context and culture in Jerusalem at that time, to pray standing in a synagogue was to take a very public posture. The same must be said about praying on street corners. It'd be a very public place for these people to do this. This is what rabbis would do. They'd cover themselves with sackcloths and ashes and say, look at me. I am worthy. I uphold the law. Hmm. That's what Martha's trying to do, right? 
Martha's trying to get everything in order in her house because the king of kings has entered. He's, she's saying, Lord, make her help me. Jesus, make her help me. Get my house in order. This is for you so that everyone else can, the, your disciples can have a place to learn. When he says, you're missing it. You can't work yourself. It's not a, work, a religion based on works. This is a religion that's born out of relationship. So as the disciples, they, <laughs> I can imagine, it's like seeing people on the, standing on the corners with the, with the Turner Burn signs today, right? It's like, you might have a different, you might want to try a different tag. I'm not saying it doesn't work, I'm just saying the odds aren't very good, <laughs> right? You have to be winsome, you have to be somewhat appealing and apologetic and logically thinking instead of, if you don't, you'll burn. That's, that's, that's not a friendly message. When Jesus is. And so they ask, they ask, because they've been hearing these prayers on the street corners, but they've also been hanging out with Jesus, right? His disciples. And they say, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? Right? Dear Garrett, I gotta be honest. <laughs> if I'm sitting with, with Jesus, I don't, if I, after we've seen all that, I don't know that that's what I'm gonna ask him. Will you teach me how to pray? How about, can you make me <laughs> king of, you know, there's all these different things that come to mind when I think of the one question. It's like you've, you've been given, granted a genie bottle and you're standing in front of the king of kings, the lord of lords, you've seen him raise the dead, you've seen him Heal people, heal the blind, and your one question is, will you teach us how to pray? There must have been something different in what they saw when they saw Jesus address his father in prayer. As we go into Luke 11, we're just going to touch on this a little bit. Jesus' model of prayer says, our father in heaven Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. And some versions say, and de but deliver us from evil. This is the model prayer. Jesus began with a direct address. Father. He then made five requests. The first dealt with God's interests. The first request is that God's name is to be hallowed, to set apart or to sanctify or to be treated as holy. Simply stated, God's reputation was and is to be revered by man. The second request was, Your kingdom come. John the Baptist says, Along with Jesus and the twelve, they've been preaching about the coming of God's kingdom. When a person prays for the coming of the kingdom, he's identifying with the message of Jesus and his followers. Not my will. Your will be done. That's a safe prayer. <laughs> That's a very safe prayer. It's also a dangerous prayer, right? Right? We want things. What is Burger King? We want it our way. Right? Hold the tomatoes. Hold the, hold the onions. Hold some of the worship. Give me 20 minutes. Three points in a song or three points in a poem. <laughs> I got to tell you, I, I love the heart of Mary. But I appreciate the attitude and the reverence of Martha. There's not a dichotomy between the two necessarily. It's just the ordering that takes place. Mary got it right. She fell directly at his feet and said, Lord, Lord. Actually, she didn't say anything. Her posture indicated it. Because he is the daily bread. The third request is for that daily bread. Bread in a general term representing the nourishment and filling of food. 
This request is for things that are necessary to sustain life for the day. The fourth request concerns man's relationship, the forgiveness of sins. Luke's already linked the forgiveness to sins. In asking for forgiveness of sins, a person expresses his faith that God will forgive him. Such a person then evidences by his faith by forgiving others. The fifth request, this is for all of us, myself especially, lead us not into temptation. But why would they pray such a prayer since God does not want people to sin? The meaning is that Jesus' followers are to pray that they be delivered from situations that would cause them to sin. His disciples, contrary to the Pharisees, realized how easily they were drawn to sin. Therefore, Jesus' followers, like us, need to ask God for help to live a righteous life. This disciple's prayer, when God asked, when asked, when asked, Lord, how should we pray? He said, our Father, our, it involves community, together, right? We gather together in his name. Our Father has the final authority as well over everything. This is His kingdom. Are we asking, is He? We've grown up with horrible fathers, some of us, or horrible grandparents. None in this room. That's the joy of being a grandparent, right? I can't wait to be a grandparent. I'm gonna, every mistake I've ever made, I'm like, I can brush it under the rug. But it, beg, it begs the question, when you say, our father, you're like, my, the dad that beat me? The dad that neglected me? No. The father who sent his son to die for you. To die for me. To die for us. This wouldn't be an Emmanuel sermon without quotes by C.S. Lewis. Relying on God has to begin all over again every day as if nothing had yet been done. For most of us, the prayer in Gethsemane is only the model. Removing mountains can wait. We must lay before him what is in us not what ought to be in us. You can't know, you can only believe, or not. A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of a bathroom stall. (laughs) So as we close... This is, a, this is a great quote from Martin Luther about the Christian faith. Luther recognizes that God not only speaks, but he also listens. Conversation is an integral part of the life of faith. Our worthiness and even our ineptness do not inhibit or preclude prayer and do not influence how God hears us. Rather, God's words, the command to pray and the promise by him to hear stake out the perimeters of the conversation. That is what Jesus offered to Mary. That is how he taught Martha about the one thing. That is what Jesus taught his disciples as he commanded them to teach others to do likewise. And that is what he commands of us today. The posture of discipleship. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the example set forth by Mary. That you allowed her to come into your feet. Father, we thank you. That's where you draw us. That's what you call us to, is to to sit at your feet, 
Father, knowing that your Son is with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. As the grass withers and the flowers fade, the word of God abides forever. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for that word from him. Let's thank God for that word. God has blessed us with such a good voices that uh, come from the pulpit here, certainly especially Pastor Dan Shaw, who will be uh, here next week and I think the week after and then Maybe he's got me up on the 30th or something, but it's nice to know that we come and everyone who's up here, every man or woman up here is going to bring the Word of God. Amen? We're going to preach it from God's Word. I did want to say before we move into communion one special thing that um, we do have our commencement tonight, Faith International uh, University and Seminary, and not just Dan Shaw's graduating. Of course, we did that a couple of weeks ago, amen, right here, and did that for him. But I also have a graduate uh, tonight by the name of Jeff Hobson, Pastor Jeff Hobson, who's coming out tonight. And we also have our own Rodney Parkos right over there. He's graduating tonight. So that's at the Church for All Nations on uh, South 112th Street as you uh, head toward Parkland just off of... Uh, 512 on Pacific. So, hope to see you tonight. Now, let us take the Lord's Supper. Uh, the scriptures are clear that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took uh, bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. And in like manner, after the bread, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And then the apostle Paul adds that as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim his death until he comes. In other words, you proclaim his death and resurrection. Amen? So let's prepare our hearts in gratitude. Remember our Lord's salvific sacrifice and thereby proclaim his life, death, and resurrection. You're doing what John just did. You're making proclamation now. Not him, but you. You're telling Jesus where you stand. Amen? You know he loves you. But on your way up, He's going to ask you this question, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And receive his presence in Jesus' name. Let's stand and pray that prayer that John just went through, and then we'll move toward the pray do's, the kneelers. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The table is ready. Please come. 